This evening, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. But what I'd like us to do is, instead of reading that text, which I've already read <laughs> to you, uh, look instead at an example of what it calls us to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. This is where Paul is commending the, uh, the churches of Macedonia for their giving to the needs of the saints and how he commends that uh, work really to all of God's people. And I would suggest to you this evening that this is a means by which the Lord actually provides for our needs. It's by giving rather than by receiving. Let me read um, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 15. And again, as I read this, let the Lord apply this to your heart. Let it stir your heart to desire to do what it is the Lord calls us to do here. He says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness, and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich." I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. But now finish doing it also, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your ability. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance may also, uh, also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack." May the Lord again bless His Word to our hearing this evening. I think it's interesting how the Old Testament sometimes is used by the writers of the New Testament. That last part was referring to the manna that they were gathering in the wilderness. The one who gathered a lot had no more than he needed. The one who gathered little had as much as he needed. And Paul applies that to our giving. Now, as you've already heard, We've seen that really the law of God is simply an explanation of love, what it is that God wants us to do, why it is He actually saved us. He saved us that we might stop hating Him and hating other people and begin loving Him. Now, we've also seen actually this evening or this morning, this afternoon actually, in the new members class, we were looking at the different means that God has given us, the different ways that He has given us to strengthen that love that is in us. But actually having a greater love, we still need to know how to direct it. And the commandments show us how we are to love. Now we have looked at the first four commandments that tell us how we are to love God. We are to put Him first in our lives. We are to give our whole lives to Him as a continual act of worship and service. We are to make sure that when we make commitments, that we keep those commitments. And of course, on this day in particular, 
We are to show our love to Him by spending the day with Him, worshiping Him, and fellowshipping with His people. We've also uh, begun looking at how the Lord would have us to love our neighbor by respecting their authority, by protecting their lives, and by protecting their purity. This evening, we want to see how we are to love our neighbor by protecting their possessions and by using the possessions that God has given to us to help them. We're going to see the application of this in the stewardship that the Lord has entrusted to us. Now, first of all, this commandment tells us that we are to protect others' possessions. That's what the words, of course, mean. You shall not steal. It tells us that we are not to take things that do not belong to us. Now, I'm sure all of us have experienced what it means to be the, the object, as it were, of somebody else's thievery. Uh, years ago, we were at this meeting or this get-together for fellowship with some Christian brothers, and, and one of the brothers brought a guitar, and we were singing to that guitar and, and uh, enjoying the time of fellowship. He set it down for just, just a couple of minutes, and we went around to the back of the house. We came back, and it was gone. It was stolen. There was a time when actually um, years ago, we had uh, had a, a worship service, not in this church, but in another church, um, out in the park. And I brought my guitar, and I brought a little amplifier I had, and a, and a chorus, and cables, and so forth. And afterwards, we went to the pastor's house, and thankfully, uh, one of the uh, worship leaders in there wanted to show me how to play something on the guitar. So I went out, got my guitar, and brought it back into the house. But a couple hours later, we went out to get in the car to leave, and the car was gone. And everything, of course, that was in the car was taken with it. And when we got the car back, of course, the stereo was gone. That's usually what gets taken is the stereo but all the, the amplifier, the cables, and all of those different things. You know, even here at the church, you would think we might be exempt from that, but, but we're not. Almost every year, like clockwork, somebody tries to break into the shed out there and succeeded for a few years, stealing all of our lawn equipment. Now, again, I think all of us have had things that are stolen. How does it feel? How does it feel to have somebody take something that belongs to you? Well, I think if you're like me, you feel violated. You want people to respect what belongs to you. You don't want them to take it. The Lord tells us that we need to treat others the way we want to be treated, that we are, of course, not to take things that belong to other people. You don't want people to take things that are yours. Don't take things that are theirs. Now, that, I think, is simple enough. And that, of course, again, is just the, uh, the surface of what this, this passage or this commandment is actually telling us, but it tells us much more. Certainly, there are things uh, that it tells us that we shouldn't take that we don't often think of as stealing or as taking from other people. For instance, in our jobs, when we don't work as reasonably hard as we should, we're actually taking away from our employers. If people give us things or, let's say, let us borrow things and we're very careless with those things and maybe we, we destroy them or, or damage them in some way, we're, we're actually taking from them. Uh, we don't, maybe don't think about this, but when we're invited to somebody's house, uh, maybe for a meal and we are inconsiderate about how much we actually eat or how, much, how long we stay, how much time we take from our host, I mean, that kind of inconsideracy can also be a form of, of taking. And we do need to be careful that we're not takers, but of course, givers. We can also take things from other people by breaking the, the commandments. Almost every one of them can be conceived of in a way in which we take something from someone. In the first commandment, for instance, if we don't love God the way we should, we are taking from Him the love that is His. In the second, if we don't serve Him, worship Him, and honor Him with our lives as we should, or if we take credit for things that we do when we know really the Lord is the one who allowed us to do it, we are taking from Him. When we don't keep our promises, the third commandment, if we make a promise to someone, we break it, we've taken something from them. If we make a promise to the Lord and we break that, we have stolen something from Him. What about the fourth commandment? If we don't spend the day with the Lord, aren't we taking time that belongs to Him, that He wants us to give to Him? 
The fifth commandment, when we don't respect the authority of those who are over us and we don't submit to them, we, we create difficulties for them. We're, we're robbing them of the honor that is theirs and making things difficult, perhaps even stealing their emotional well-being because, you know, we, we're not doing what they're telling us to do and they can't get us to do what we should do. The sixth commandment, of course, when we don't give the help that is necessary for somebody to preserve their life. We are taking from them if we have the ability to help them. And the Lord has shown us that need, but we don't do it. Or the seventh commandment, we can rob somebody else of their purity, either in their body or their heart or their mind by the way we conduct ourselves. The ninth commandment, if we bear false witness, we can rob them of their reputation. And of course, the tenth commandment, we can also, in our minds, in coveting, take what other people have. There's a lot of different ways that we can take things from other people, from God and from our neighbor, and we need to be careful. The Lord tells us, you shall not steal. I think it goes without saying that if you have taken something that doesn't belong to you, that you do need to return it. You know, there's the question of uh, whether uh, in, in, the new t- well, in the new covenant, whether what the Lord tells us to do in the old covenant still applies. You know, in the old covenant, if you took somebody, something from somebody, you needed to give it back. You needed perhaps even to make restitution beyond that. And certainly, if you don't have it anymore, you need to give them something that is of, the, of equal value to that. And you need to ask forgiveness. So don't steal. But if you do, if you have taken something, you do need to make restitution and you do need to ask forgiveness. But this commandment has not only to do with taking what doesn't belong to you, it also has to do with protecting what belongs to others. If somebody, if we see somebody stealing something, then we need to do what we can to prevent that theft. I think uh, all of us are more than ready to do that these days because there's so much stealing that's going on. That's what Neighborhood Watch is all about. We're looking out for our neighbor's goods, and if you see somebody stealing something, then you you seek to prevent it. Of course, it doesn't mean you go out and intervene necessarily, but perhaps you call the police. One time, I woke up in the middle of the night and just happened to look out the window, and I saw somebody putting the neighbor's car up on blocks and stealing their their tires and wheels. I, I could hardly believe what I was seeing. And so I called the police, But interestingly enough, another neighbor was on the phone with the police at that exact moment telling him about that exact crime, and they did catch the guy. Turned out to be a a friend of the person (laughs) whose, whose cars or whose wheels were being stolen. But we are supposed to do what we can to protect other people's possessions. If somebody leaves something out and you see it, uh, try to secure it for your neighbor. If they're, if they're at home, let them know it's out there and liable to be stolen. If you see their, their pet, their dog, even if you don't like that dog, you know, if you see it running out there and you, you really wish it would maybe get run over instead, you still need to go and tell the neighbor to secure the dog because it's their dog, it's their possession, and they care about it. So the Lord is telling us, again, not just not to steal, but also to protect our neighbor's belongings and not just, you know, physically, but also in our heart, make sure that we don't covet them since, well, but since the Lord devotes, of course, a commandment to that, we're not going to deal with that particular aspect until we get to it. But now let's look at something that we don't often look at when we consider this commandment, and that is that it not only deals with respecting what belongs to other people, what the Lord gives to our neighbor, it also has to do with what the Lord gives to you and how you Uh, manage that stewardship. Remember that the Lord gives you what He does give to you for a purpose. And when we're not faithful with the stewardship that God has given to us, then in a certain sense we are stealing from Him. Now, what would you think of a steward who who is basically entrusted with his master's possessions and simply takes all that his master has given to him and spends it on himself but he spends nothing for the master's use. Well, I think we would call that person an unfaithful steward, wouldn't we? You know, not too long ago, very sadly, a local pastor, 
was actually entrusted with one of his members' life savings in order to build a museum for him. Sadly, instead of building the museum, the, the pastor embezzled all the money, spent the money on himself, spent the money on his family, and then when he was confronted by the man who actually had entrusted these funds to him, he tried to cover up his crime by murdering that member, and he actually succeeded. He was an unrighteous and unfaithful steward of that man's belongings. He basically embezzled all the man entrusted to him and spent it on himself. Well, we need to make sure that we don't do the same thing with what the Lord has entrusted to us because the Lord has given to us what He has given to us for a variety of reasons, and all of them are good reasons, and actually all of them end in uh, not only the good of others, the good of His kingdom, but also in our good. Now, we know the Lord has given to us the things that He has given to us in order to provide for our own needs. The Lord is not saying that He gives us everything so that we would give it all away because He knows we need things. He wants us, of course, to provide for our own, our own needs, to purchase a home if we need a home, to buy the things that we need for that home, to provide for ourselves clothing and food, uh, to invest money to provide for our futures, of course, to even to buy things that we enjoy. And certainly, one thing that the Scripture tells us over and over again is that the righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children. So the Lord does expect us actually to have possessions and to use those things for our own needs and even for our own enjoyment. But what I would like us to focus on are the other things that the Lord would have us to invest in as well. Now, some of these are connected, not surprisingly, again, with the other commandments. For instance, the first and the second commandment that tells us that we are to love God and have Him as our God and to worship Him in the way He would have us to worship Him reminds us that we are to be using part of what the Lord gives to us to support His work through tithes and offerings. Uh, the fifth commandment, that we are to honor our father and mother, tells us that we are to honor all authority and reminds us that we are to support the government through our taxes. The sixth commandment reminds us that we are to give to protect life. And by the way, um, though there may be a lot of people asking for things around us, as we know, we see them all over the place, and they may be there by choice and it may not be a legitimate need, we know that there are lots of legitimate needs. We basically live because of the internet and because of people, you know, that travel and so forth. The world is becoming so much smaller. We live in a worldwide community and we're aware, I think, of, of a lot of needs that are around, especially the need to feed uh, children and to educate children. And as the Lord gives us ability, perhaps we can, you know, help them. We can protect their lives. We also know that our giving doesn't always have to be just in the area of, um, what would you say, uh, helping people survive. Uh, sometimes we, we give just because we want to show kindness or show mercy to someone. I think when Paul tells the thief not to steal any longer, but to work so as to give to those in need, that's certainly one thing, not, not those who are just absolutely destitute or to save lives, sometimes it's to relieve suffering in other ways, or to encourage somebody, or to be a blessing to someone, to relieve or take some of the burden from them if the Lord allows us to do that. That's another way that we can give. Let's also not forget that the Lord has given to us other things that we can give besides the financial resources. He has given to us gifts. He's given to us time. Uh, we can use that to, to build up the body of Christ. You know, when the Lord um, uh, gives a particular individual to a congregation, it's really His intention that that individual use their time and their gifts, at least to some degree, to build up that particular local body. And when we, we don't give of those things to do that, we're actually taking something that the Lord has intended to be a gift and a blessing to that church. So we want to make sure that we use uh, those things for His glory as well. 
Now, I think this is all a part of our stewardship. Remember that we are stewards, and that really applies to everything about us. It might, you know, again, be used to describe, you might say, the position that the Lord has given to us, and it is really a blessed position to have to be a steward in the house of the Lord. But as a steward, we need to understand that what we have and what we are belongs to the Lord. Our possessions, we say are ours, really are not ours. They belong to Him. Our time belongs to Him. Our talents, our gifts, they don't belong to us. We don't even belong to us. Everything we have actually belongs to the Lord. And He has given us these things not only to provide for ourselves and ours, but that we might use them in other ways. The command or this command calls us to be faithful to that stewardship, to be faithful in using what the Lord has given to us. Again, not just with a narrow focus as the the man who was entrusted another man's possessions to do something for him. Actually, in that case, the man didn't actually intend the the minister to do anything for himself, but rather to do all of this for him. The Lord gives us the things that he gives us to provide for us, but also for these other things. We need to make sure that we're aware of these other things and that we are doing what the Lord would have us to do in meeting those particular needs or giving of those particular things he would have us to give. In other words, to be faithful to that stewardship and again remembering that As the stewards we see in Scripture, one day have to give an account, so we will also have to give an account of the uh, the things that the Lord has actually entrusted to us. Now, let me just mention that there is one other thing that the Lord has given to us, and it is a great treasure. It is the most precious thing that we actually own. And it's something that God wants us to give away, and we don't want to to miss that. And that is the gospel. The Lord has entrusted this treasure to us, as Paul said to Timothy, in order that he may entrust it to others. And that's something that we need to see also as a deposit that God has given to us as a part of our stewardship. And that we are to take that and give it away freely as much as we possibly can, not to hold on to it, but to be like the seed sower, to take it and broadcast it as far as we possibly can. You know how precious the gospel is to you, how precious God has made it to you. Well, God has given you the privilege of giving that away. And He will, of course, reward you for doing so, and those who receive it will also be greatly blessed. So don't hold on to that, but give that away also. Now, let's close this particular, um, well, treatment of this this, um, commandment with the blessing that God tells us will actually be ours if if we give. I mean, not only is giving, you know, not stealing, but, but working to give the right thing to do, it is also the way to greater blessing. Our Lord Jesus tells us, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I know that we often take this this statement of Christ and we we sort of apply it maybe, you know, at Christmas, okay? Think about Christmas. You know, at Christmas, especially as children, you know, we really look forward to Christmas because we get presents, you know? the, The room maybe is full of presents or we certainly get more than we would get at other times of the year. At least that's the way it was in our household, and as children, we really looked forward to that. But as we got older, we began enjoying giving more than receiving and found greater blessing in making other people happy than making ourselves happy. Actually, I think we were happier than the people who actually got the gifts. That's what happens when we grow up and we begin to see, you know, what the Lord says with regard to giving. But you know what? I don't think, and I thought it was interesting, I don't think that's exactly what the Lord has in mind here, though it is true. I think what the Lord is talking about here has to do with which position you would rather be in 
in the giving and receiving you know, transaction. Would you rather be the one in need who needs you know, the charity of others, or would you rather be somebody who can meet that need? John Gill, in his commentary uh, where he's addressing this uh, well, the statement of Christ in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, says this. He says, it, or this giving rather than receiving, uh, really has four benefits. It's more comfortable, it's more honorable, it's more pleasant, and it's more profitable. What does he mean by that? Well, first of all, it's more comfortable. The giver, he says, is in a more comfortable situation, having an abundance, at least a sufficiency, and something to spare, whereas the receiver is often in want and distress and so uncomfortable. See, it's more blessed to be in the position of giving than receiving because it's more comfortable. Secondly, he says it's more honorable. It is an honor to give. An honor is reflected upon the giver both by the receiver and others when to receive is an instance of meanness and carries in it among men some degree of dishonor. Thirdly, it's more pleasant. He says it is a pleasure to a liberal man to distribute to the necessities of others and it cannot be a pleasure for a man to be in such circumstances as to make it necessary for him to receive from others and be dependent on them. And then lastly, it's more profitable. And great are the advantages and profit which a cheerful giver reaps, both in this world and that to come. Wherefore, the conclusion which the apostle would have drawn from this is that it is much more blessed for a man to work with his own hands and support himself and assist others than to receive at the hands of others. I think we'd all agree that's true. We'd rather, much rather be in that position than in the other position. By the way, let me just make a note that he doesn't say here, I'm sure he must have been thinking about this, but when we give, we are not to give so that others see us and applaud us. We're not seeking the honor of others but rather that the Lord would see us in secret and reward us. Now, that being the case, how can you, how can I be the one who is blessed? Well, I think simply this. Seek, by God's grace, to be on the giving end of the transaction. And I think the more that you are faithful to do this and to give, the more the Lord will give to you, the more you're going to receive from Him so that you'll have more to give. Now, what about the person who doesn't have very much to give? Is this something they can't do? I mean, do you have to have a lot in order to give? Well, not really. Because remember, on one instance, the Lord was sitting outside the temple and He was observing the people who were putting money in the offering. And as people were coming and giving out of their abundance, there was a poor widow who came and she put one cent into the treasury, just one penny. And Jesus said, you see what this widow has done? She has put in more than all of the other contributors combined because they gave out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, gave everything that she had. You don't have to have a lot to give. You only have to have something to give. And perhaps one of the reasons why we struggle uh, with having maybe even our own needs met, struggle in our area of resources, with, with all of our resources, our gifts, talents, our times, or the time that we have, or finances, might be because we're not willing to give those things to others. Maybe our gift isn't as strong as it might be because we're not exercising and using it to help others. Or maybe we're stingy with our time and we're not willing to give that to someone else so we find ourselves always cramped for time. You know, my own experience, and I'm sure you've found this to be true as well, if you set aside what you think is important sometimes in order to give time to someone else, the Lord seems to so bless what it is that you had to do to begin with that you, it requires much less time to do it than if you had simply not dealt with this other need. Perhaps we don't have as much as we would like of these things because we're not willing to give uh, these things as much as we should. 
Now, I think Scripture is very clear in this particular principle that the more faithful we are in using what the Lord gives to us, the more God will give to us, the more He will entrust to us. The more we are faithful with the stewardship that He has given to us, the more we will have basically to steward for Him. And let me give you that from a couple passages in Scripture. Here's one example of this principle of giving. When it's applied to giving to the Lord's work, the first and second commandment, Malachi 3, verses 8 through 10. And this is pretty serious language, and we do need to take it seriously. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now what the Lord is saying here is that if you would be faithful to, to give as the Lord calls you to give to his cause, he will make sure that you have not only more than you've given, but, you know, but much more than that so that you'll have an abundance. The reason why Israel was suffering was because they were failing to give to the Lord as they should. He says through Solomon in Proverbs 19, 17, with regard to giving to the poor, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Basically, the Lord is saying, I'm going to take upon myself the burden to pay you back if you are gracious and give to someone. And then another one with regard to the poor, which you've already alluded to. But when you give to the poor, Jesus says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The Lord says that there is a blessing in giving. I think it multiplies virtually everything that we give away. If we give away our gifts, if we use them for one another, if we give of our time to serve one another, if we give of our resources to help one another, the Lord says He will give back to us. So if you want more so that you might do more, then you need to do more with what you have. You need to love the Lord and others more in this way and the Lord will give you more. You know, there's actually a book written by one of the Puritans called Riches Increased by Giving, based on this particular principle. Now, if we do this, not only will we experience more of God's blessing, being on the giving end rather than the receiving, and not only will you have more because of the Lord's blessing, but at the same time, you will be storing up treasures in heaven, and not the least of which, you will be following Jesus' example. You'll notice that Jesus didn't go around taking from people. Jesus went around giving, and He was doing precisely what He says His Father does for everyone. He says in Luke 6, verses 32 through 36, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. May the Lord grant to us then the grace not to take from others, but rather to do as Paul exhorted the thief, not to steal any longer, but to work so that you may have something to give to those who are in need. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us um, take that to heart. This is His truth and there's a blessing that is here if we're willing to do what the Lord calls us to do.
when he gives us those opportunities.